Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. You have to excuse me for a second there. I thought I was in the early service where we don't have doxology, so it's just kind of a little warped in my mind. Uh, we've read the scripture this morning, which was Matthew 18 through 25, and that was part of our Advent reading. And right now we're in the second week of a journey we're taking, a journey to Bethlehem with Mary and Joseph. Uh, we're still stuck in Nazareth, though. Uh, last week we talked about Mary and how Mary had given a God a great gift. And that was the gift of, of herself. You might remember the angel Gabriel coming and telling Mary of God's plans and of Mary saying, yes, let it be to me according to your word. That's hard to do, to give God that gift of self. But as you can tell, it pays great dividends. Today we visit Nazareth again and look at Joseph as an angel came and talked to him. Let's begin with prayer. Holy God, set us afire with the truths of Jesus' birth, of Mary saying yes, of Joseph accepting the call to be the earthly father of Jesus, and of their journey later to Bethlehem. And in this season of hope, burn away our sins, burn away our doubts, and transform our lack of passion into a blazing zeal to be your people. Amen. Pastor named uh, John Buchanan tells a story about a four-year-old girl. It was about a week or so before Christmas, and she was drawing a scene uh, of the manger. So when she got through with it, as four-year-olds do, she proudly went to her mother to show it to her mom. and She uh, pointed at each of the figures that she had drawn and told her mom what they were and, and why they were there, you know, the the shepherds, uh, the wise men, the, the sheep, the camels. And she, of course, pointed out in the middle of it all, Mary and the baby. And her mother noticed, though, that somebody was messing from the picture there. So she said, well, Megan, where, where's, where's Joseph? And Megan thought for a moment and said, who needs Joseph anyway? Well... Actually, God needed Joseph. And more especially, God needed a good man. And God needed a, a good man who he would rely on to do a, a few things, culminating with the decision <clears throat> to become the father, the earthly father of Jesus. You know, we... Um, sometimes forget about Joseph ourselves. We look past him on the manger scene, and we don't read much about him in the Bible because there's not a lot of verses there to read. And we hear songs about Mary, but I don't remember hearing a song about Joseph, although I'm told there are songs that exist. So we sometimes ignore Joseph but he was just the man God was looking for. You know, we don't have much background information on him. 
we do know a few things, though, just from Jewish culture and from the few scriptures there, there are. Uh, for example, we know that he was from the, the lineage, the, the family of King David, who had ruled in the glory days of Israel hundreds of years before. And uh, a number of people on, on earth had, had a Joseph's day descended from that line, but Joseph was one. And the importance of that is that the prophets had for hundreds of years prophesied that the coming Messiah would come from the family of David. And Joseph filled the bill. Now Mark 6.3 also tells us that Joseph was a carpenter. And in that day and time, that meant that his father had been a carpenter before him, and his father before him, and, and, and so on back probably for hundreds of years to the first carpenter in the family. And it also meant Jesus would be trained uh, as a carpenter. And we know that uh, Joseph was a Jewish male, so that meant some things too. That meant that unlike the girls in that time, when he was a boy, he would have been sent to rabbinical schools and he would have learned scripture and Hebrew. And he might also have learned Greek and Latin so he could do his business. And that also meant that one day when he was 13, he would kind of have his coming out as a man and celebrate a bar mitzvah and read scripture publicly for the first time. That also meant something else. In that culture, at that time, a man was around 20 before he was thought mature enough to take a woman in marriage. Now you might remember this was unlike the women who were expected to marry as soon as they became of age. So, so likely as we talked about last week, Mary was probably about 13. And we also know that while Joseph's extended family, uh, and, and, and original family had its roots in, in Bethlehem that probably his immediate family and him lived in Nazareth. Like we talked about last week, Nazareth was a town of about 200 people at that time. So it's likely he and his family knew Mary and Mary's family. And, and although you normally hear that Joseph's parents probably arranged the marriage for him, that wasn't so. Because when the male came of age to be married, it was his choice who to marry. And it was his choice to make the arrangements uh, with the family. Although he did look to his parents if there was any dowry paid. But probably because he was just a common laborer, uh, he only went to Mary's parents with, with a little bit of money. 20, 20 shekels or so was about what that social class paid in that day. So he went to Mary's parents with about 20 shekels and asked for Mary's hand in marriage because he had decided she was the woman he wanted to spend his life with and he wanted to bear her children. And Mary's parents agreed. So you might think that the first thing they would do would have a party, but, but actually back then they would go to a rabbi and Mary and Joseph and her parents would sign a contract to uh, make it all right and, and legal in the eyes of Jewish law. And then they would go to planning their wedding. But the wedding wouldn't happen for about a year. They were in the state called betrothal. Now, y'all have probably been betrothed, or some of you. But, but back then, it was supposed to last this period of a year, and they could start seeing each other, but they could only see each other if they had a chaperone with them. It's a little bit different than things are today. And then lo and behold, Mary turned up pregnant. Joseph <clears throat> puts it, she was found to be with child. And Joseph knew that because he was a faithful man, he had only been with Mary and there was a chaperone around. And he was not the father. 
awkward. Now, now Luke 142 goes to tell us that uh, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth after she was pregnant, Elizabeth called Mary most blessed among women. And if Mary was most blessed among women, when he heard the news, Joseph was most angry among men. Um, the news was actually a, a kick in the gut to Joseph. I don't know how, how you men would react. I know how I would react. You know, if you've decided to live with someone, marry them, your plans are more or less set out for the future, and then lo and behold, things change. They're turned upside down. And, and I can see very clearly how I would react. I'd be mad. And I don't know about you guys, I, I would want some pain inflicted on somebody. Mary and the, and the guy. Now, Joseph had a right to do that. He, he had a right to revenge. I mean, he could literally have Mary buried under a ton of rocks. That was Jewish law in those days, that uh, a woman who committed adultery was to be stoned to death. So Joseph had a decision. He had been kicked in the gut, shocked by what Mary had done. It was at this point, though, that God decided he would rely on Joseph to react not with judgment and not with punishment, but with mercy and compassion. Now, now you can understand Joseph's probable reaction to her pregnancy. There's a pastor named Will Willimon, and he was a pastor at Duke University one time. And a student went to Willimon and said, I'm losing my faith. And Willimon said, well, why is that? And he said, I cannot believe in the virgin birth. Don't you have to believe in the virgin birth to be a Christian? And Wilmon said, well, in one sense, yes. In another sense, no. We, we, we ask that you believe in the virginal birth. And, and then if you can swallow that, we move on to bigger stuff like the miracles and the resurrection of Jesus. And Joseph was about where that young man was when Mary told him about her pregnancy. That was impossible. That was ridiculous. That couldn't happen. His only choice was whether to seek revenge. And Matthew says that because Joseph was a righteous man, he decided to call the engagement off quietly so as not to embarrass her. God relied upon Joseph to be compassionate and merciful, even in a time of great pain, even to the person who he felt had caused it. And he came through. God chose well. And it's likely no accident that he had chosen Joseph. So Joseph could instill that same reaction in Jesus. Now, God wasn't through with Joseph. Because that wasn't the only thing God relied on him to do. That was just step one. He, he needed to go one more step. And that's when God relied on Joseph, not just to be a merciful and compassionate man, but to be obedient to his will in his word. After Joseph decided what he was going to do, let her go quietly, 
a messenger came to Joseph in his dreams. The messenger said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child in her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Now, you can imagine Joseph waking up the next morning, you know. Man, did I dream that? Uh, has anything like that ever happened to y'all? It happened to me. It happened to me. One night I had a dream. This was uh, back in 1991. And it was clear as a bell. And Jesus himself told me this was going to happen to me. This had to happen. And, and I just had to accept it. Well, tell me exactly what would happen. It would be painful. Well, see... I had already made up my mind about what I was going to do. So I did that. And because I did what I did, it made the pain far worse for me and everybody else. Have you ever heard the Bible term stiff-necked? You know, sometimes we decide to go our own way. We ignore the word from God. The word might not just come in Jesus' appearance in a dream, but in a, in a stirring of our heart, uh, in, in something someone says to us, in an injustice that we see that enrages us, and we need to do something about it. But, but we ignore it because we've made up our minds. And, and indeed, it's even harder once you've made up your mind, as Joseph had, to remain open to God in times of stress, in times of pain, because it's at those times that we're most likely to, to turn around. So again, God chose the right man because Joseph was still open to God's will, and when he heard the word, recognized it, and obeyed it. Does anybody here, here ever worry about making mistakes while you're parenting and paying for them? Yeah. This is an aside. Think about how Joseph must have felt. <laughs> you know, make a mistake with Jesus. Don't smite me, God. So, so first, God relied on Joseph to be a merciful and compassionate man. And then he relied on him to be open and obedient. But he wasn't through yet. He relied on Joseph to be Jesus' earthly father. And not just that, but to be a good one. Because you see, we do proclaim that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And sometimes we forget about that human part. We forget that Jesus wept at Lazarus' grave. We forget that he cried out from the cross. We forget that he sweated bullets uh, the night he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. We forget that he got angry with the money changers and tore their tables down and chased them out of the temple. Now think about it. Jesus was partly or fully human in addition to be fully divine. And he would need a human father to teach him how to humble himself like Joseph did. And he would need a human father to teach him how to handle the disapproval of others, like Joseph did. You know, Joseph still had disapproval to come to him even when he decided to marry. Because people can do the math, and he would be the one blamed for having relationship with her before marriage. Jesus also needed a father who could teach him how to handle difficult and painful situations and remain faithful. You know, Mary's pregnancy had devastated Joseph. 
how hard or how easy it would have been to turn from God when that happened, but instead he stayed faithful throughout. God had relied upon him, and he had responded well. Now, of course, the truth is, is that Jesus isn't the only one who could profit from the example of Joseph. Because, in fact, we all can. We all struggle with tough and, and, and even crushing disappointment. We all have times when we want to lash out in anger. We all have times when we decide upon our path, but God intervenes to show us God's will. Yet even in those times, God calls us to be merciful and compassionate. Even in hard circumstances. Even to those who have hurt us. God calls us to be open and obedient to his will, even in dark or challenging times, even when we've decided what we want to do. And God calls us to live out our calls well, just as Joseph lived out his call to be a good father. We're to be good fathers or good pastors or good mothers or good students or good farmers, or good granddaddies, or good engineers. We all have our call. You see, it's a wonderful metaphor here that Joseph was a carpenter, a builder. As you think of the kind of man he was and the kind of character he showed, and you know that he was a builder of God's kingdom. And that is the same call upon us to build up that kingdom through our faithfulness to God. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, empower us to be like Joseph. How easy it is to become angry, to turn away from you, to follow, follow our own will, to fall short in the lives you have given us and the calls you have made upon our life. Strengthen us that we might be merciful and compassionate even when we want to judge and hurt, that we can be open to your will even in times of stress and even when we've decided our own way, and that we live out our calls well, being faithful to you throughout. Amen.